Hi, and welcome to Dino Live, the new live video series from travel booking and expense management provider Circo, where we feature subject matter experts on various topics across the corporate travel industry. I'm Tony Destalfo, and today I'm joined by James Mulder, co founder and executive director at TEM, Tasman Environmental Markets. Now, James, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. This is a hot topic, a lot of conversation. So, James, but, but before we get started and diving in, um, give me a quick overview of what TEM is and uh, what it can provide specifically as it relates to business travel. Yeah, thanks, Tony, and thanks for having us. Um, TEM was established in 2014 in Australia as a carbon development business uh, that was helping corporate corporate clients meet some of their environmental goals and targets. So we set ourselves up as a, as a business dealing mainly with some of the large airlines in this part of the world, um, most notably Qantas, uh, where we helped them on their sustainability journey by providing offset products and, and services into, into the travel industry. So that's, that was sort of the genesis for our business. Um, and over time, it's developed into a technology business, which really provides the technology for travel businesses to uh, consider, reduce, and then offset the emissions that they've uh, that they've caused as, as a result of their travel activity. So that's that's kind of who Tim is. We're uh, you know uh, a, a team based in Melbourne and Sydney in Australia, with a small team in Auckland, New Zealand. Great, thanks for that. Um, now you guys have been at it since I think you said. 2014. So sustainability, 2014, yeah. the conversation has been around for a long time. Um, and we've seen some glimmers of activity, you know, kind of, uh, particularly in travel, it's gotten a lot more heated up lately. Um, so what, what do you think is different today, James? I mean, what, 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 what has changed? Uh, it's a really good question. And something that we're seeing, like, uh, I guess, is not coming from one sector. Um, companies, customers are asking what they're doing around sustainability. Companies, investors are asking what they're doing around um, sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, staff are asking what's being done around sustainability. So it's coming from all angles. And where maybe five, six years ago, you know, somebody may do some carbon offsetting or do some sustainability initiatives with staff, you know, post it on LinkedIn or on a social media channel. It's kind of morphed where companies are now being asked to make specific targets and specific reductions, which are measurable and auditable and verifiable. So we've gone from a sort of nice to have PR type thing into, into a set of chain, well, set of um, frameworks where um, businesses are being held to account for a lot of their reduction activities. And obviously in the travel industry, a lot of those reductions are quite hard uh, mm -hmm. because there are too many alternatives or substitutes for um, for travel in some cases. So that's why there's a lot of scrutiny on travel. And that's why we think some of the tools that we've developed um, uh, can help people in that regard. Now, now, what specifically are they are they measuring or reporting today? Uh, primarily carbon emissions. So there are some businesses that go a little bit further than that and measure some other environmental impacts, but primarily they're trying to measure the carbon that's been emitted as a result of the travel activity. So whether it be um, emissions out the back of a jet engine while you fly across the United States, mm -hmm. whether it's the rental car that you drove between uh, LAX and downtown uh, Los Angeles, or whether it's the uh, the ship that traveled, you know, between uh, Florida and, uh, and somewhere nice and warm in, in the Caribbean. People are wanting accurate calculations for the emissions intensity of that trip so that A, they can report it, mm -hmm. and second of all, if they can't reduce it, that they offset what they haven't been able to reduce. And that way they can actually start to you know, create a narrative and start to put into their reporting, hey, look, we're taking this seriously. We're, we're measuring what we're doing. We're making choices to reflect the fact that we want to reduce our emissions. And for where we haven't been able to do that, we've offset. Now, who who typically is funding this in the, you know, so this is a travel audience, right? And, you know, so I would assume, though, that this is probably getting 
some visibility in the C-suite, right? Is there, there's broader initiatives that go beyond travel, sustainable building, sustainable getting to work. Uh, so who, who, yeah. you know, who do you see? Like, who's the, is there a chief sustainability officer? Have we gone that far or who, or where would this sit? So we, we do see like Qantas has got a chief sustainability officer. So, and that's a C-suite executive reporting directly to the chief executive. So mm -hmm. those sort of roles do exist now. In addition to that, you know, we, we, we deal with CFOs because there's a there's an investor angle. Investors are starting to become more agitated about climate action and what's being done. So quite often we'll see CEOs um, engaging um, with CFOs around, you know, what's being done. In addition, we, we see quite often the marketing, uh, the marketing teams getting involved because it's a customer proposition that they want to position and market which is um, which is sustainable. So it depends really on where um, you know where where the impetus is coming from within the organisation. But it is percolating to the C-suite, and quite often it's the CEO that's actually driving it because he's or she have got a view right across the organisation as to where the pressure is coming, and they're, and they're feel, feeling it in all respects. Um, and it's leading a lot of businesses and a lot in the United States to. Uh, to start to make commitments publicly. So, you know, some of your largest corporates, like, you know, PepsiCo is a, a good example. Last year, they doubled down on their science-based targets and uh, made a commitment that they would reduce their scope three emissions, which includes travel and transport, by 40% by 2030 from 2015 levels. So um, these are things that have now have to be measured and they need to be reduced and where they can't be reduced they need to be offset so these have transitioned as i sort of said before from nice to haves now to must have commitments which now need a rigor around them to show how they've been calculated and show how the reductions are occurring yeah so pu publicly traded company makes a statement to shareholders to industry to their own folks um, that they are going to change something about their business and and specifically in the case of uh, PepsiCo, as you just said, they're going to reduce their carbon by X. That's it. That's a, a measurable. Yeah, that's right. That's not just X. It's X by Y. Based on. Oh, I got it. So, so yes, by a certain date. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. So I think that that's one of the big changes that we've started to see, where people are actually putting frameworks together, whether it be, um, you know, the task forces for sustainable development. Um, even the accounting standard boards are, around the world are starting to come up with methodologies around how people need to report their sustainability act activities and their carbon reductions, um, right through to the science-based target initiatives that people like PepsiCo and the US are using. So the frameworks that people are starting to apply are becoming um, more, more advanced and, and moving from, tell us about your broad strategy to, what are you actually doing by when and how are you measuring it? So that's been a big shift, I think, Tony, in, in the last uh, in the last year or so, particularly since the Glasgow uh, COP meeting uh, late last year, where you know the whole carbon market and the role of corporates in making reductions alongside governments really um, re really got a big kick along. Okay, so we we have a framework, and then we have a set of goals that are measurable, reportable yeah. within a specific timeline. Yeah. So that's that speaks to real commitment. So the next question is, particularly as it relates to, to business travel, um, the knee jerk reaction might be uh, just don't travel or travel less, right? Which yeah. I think is, which I've seen and heard people say, Right. I don't know that we can go to that extreme without having dramatic impacts on on a company's performance, let's just say. So yeah. what are they doing? What, what are they doing, like uh, specifically right at the point of decision? I'm going to book a trip. What do you see people doing? Yeah. And it, the, the first thing I think they're starting to do is actually starting to measure the, the emissions that they're, you know, that they're taking. So step one. So the first thing is actually just being aware of oh, gee, I didn't realize that was going to emit one and a half tons of CO2 into the atmosphere by me just doing this particular trip. 
So I think that um, that's the first thing. The second thing is is that um, that a lot of the tools now, including you know uh, our Blue Halo product, mm -hmm. are starting to give you choices. So if you fly across the United States in a relatively old 757, the difference in emissions between you doing that and flying in, a, in an ultra model, modern 777 is, you know, tens of percent different. Mm. Uh, so the way in which you fly and the routes that you travel, um, it may be a little bit cheaper to route through a particular hub, but it's in, in a carbon sense, you're flying a lot longer on a, a much older aircraft. Um, you know, all of a sudden those sort of uh, choices become, you know, able to be made and, and trade-offs made. Or even just saying, I'm actually going to catch the train from Boston to New York rather than flying because the emissions associated with that rail trip on the Accelerator are much smaller than um, than if I, you know, if I fly into LaGuardia. Well, shameless plug because we, we've integrated the Blue Halo product into into Zeno, and what we always try to do is right at the point of decision, what we call the point of purchase, to give information. Uh, give him, give people as much information as possible and it's yeah. and you know it, it's no longer how long does the trip take how much does the trip cost it's now um how much carbon am i emitting because as you just suggested there are differences right big differences yeah yeah now have you have you worked directly with companies and i assume um you are working with directly with companies and are, so like take somebody like PepsiCo this would be part of a an overall approach that they would take right fit it into the framework let's see how much our business travel is doing and then let's see what we can do about it. is that is that kind of the way it works out yeah it is and also just putting the information in front of it you know in front of the person that's making the booking right so they can actually see line items you know you're presented with three particular choices when you're flying to Atlanta um and the carbon intensity of each of those trips has started to be listed out by by carrier or by aircraft or by service or by time. So all of a sudden, some of the stuff puts, you know, the staff member in a position where they can actually do something, which a lot of staff are, are looking for. But in addition to that, if the company has a, a, a comprehensive offset program associated with that travel, the customer or the, the staff member knows that the trip's actually going to get offset regardless of whether or not, you know, or what happens. So they're, they're doing the right thing, but what they can't avoid gets offset it, and it gets captured and reported and, and tracked so that managers are able to, you know, to look at their progress against their targets over time. So what, um, what practical advice would you give a travel buyer? We have a lot of travel buyers. We have a lot of uh, travel management companies. Uh, we're all in the business of managing travel. We're assuming it's going to continue to happen. And yeah. it's, part of, it's part of the dilemma, so to speak. So practical recommendations for somebody that's, that's in that position. First thing really, I think, is um, presenting the information in a form where people can actually make choices and actions. That would be the, one of the first things. Second thing is making sure that the calculations are valid. Because in quite a lot of cases, those trade-offs, um, if you use somebody's got a spreadsheet somewhere or, or um, you know, it's not a very robust process, um, the trade-offs aren't that apparent. And thirdly, around the calculations, making sure that if you're a US business, making sure that you're applying a standard which is applicable to your own environment. So the US EPA, for example, publish emissions factors, as does the Canadian government, as does the UK government and so on. So different jurisdictions have different approaches to, to how they want to see some of the stuff reported. So the other piece of it is making sure that you match up your own narrative and your own desires into the carbon calculation for you, because it isn't it isn't like a t-shirt, you know, one size fits most. It is actually a little bit more bespoke than that. And we see a lot of companies making decisions around how they want to look at carbon, um, which are quite different from others. So we've got some companies, for example, that say, look, we want to include the emissions associated with extracting the oil out of an oil field somewhere 
in another part of the world and transporting it to the side of the uh, aircraft before it gets loaded. Other companies say, look, we also want to include the, um, the effects of uh, putting jet fuel into the atmosphere above 10,000 metres or, or 30,000 feet because the impact is different. So we want to include that as well. So the way in which you bootstrap up that calculation is very particular to the particular company and the standards that they're setting themselves up for and even their own strategy and, and, and views on whether they should be taking account of that or not. So it is it is a little bit of a um, horses for courses, as we say down under type um, uh, type challenge. But the good thing is, is that a lot of the tools that you know Blue Halo provides makes that a pretty easy set of um, you know configuration options for you, depending on what you want to do and how you want to do it. So configurable to the client uh based on what they want to do question one last thing before i let this part go sustainable aviation fuel yeah is something i've heard a lot of conversation about um is that something you can accommodate and is it something you think is going to have an impact yes it is and we're working on our our SAF for sustainable aviation fuel product at the moment it's pretty early days for, yeah. for it. One of, the, one of the hallmarks of the Blue Halo environment is we've got very, very high levels of integrity around the registries and the projects and the calculations and everything else. Um, the markets around sustainable aviation fuel are still being developed to the frameworks yeah. of the registries, making sure that when somebody said that they did something that it actually got done. Yeah. Um, you know, if we look back in some environmental markets over the last 10 years the early when they got up and running they, there wasn't quite as much rigor with that um, reputationally we think it's important that whatever is deployed is absolutely beyond reproach so um, watch the space around SAF it will come and it is coming and we are working on it it's not quite there yet Good to hear. Thank you very much. Fascinating. We could go probably for another half hour, but uh, Xeno Live is only intended to be about 15, 20 minutes. So if it's okay with you, as I normally do to close these things out, I'll move you into a place we call the, uh, the Xeno Zone, where I ask you a couple of quick hit questions to get a little bit for, uh, give our audience a little bit uh, more familiarity with James. So uh, you ready to go? Yeah, far away. Here we go. Uh, you have a major business decision to make, and you can call anyone. Who gets your call? Uh, it would probably, well, assuming that they can be alive or dead, I would probably call Thomas Edison, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I've always been a, a person that's a little bit of a contrarian, and uh, innovation has always been my thing. So um, uh, it would probably be somebody like Thomas Edison, because... Uh, um, uh, Business is, is about marching things forward, in my view, and uh, innovation is really, really close to my heart. So I'd, I'd choose someone like Thomas Edison. All right, I'll take that. Uh, have some fun now. Um, you have uh, dinner for four, so you can invite three guests. Again, anybody, any period of time, dead or alive. Uh, who's at James's table? Uh, it would be Elvis, would be the first person off the list. Because, um, I love it. <laughs> It, it, as long as he's not working a shift at a Walmart somewhere in the Midwest, I think um, uh, it would be great to have Elvis. I'd, I'd probably also in, include Steve Jobs. Okay. Uh, because I'd love to know what he would have done after the iPad uh, if he hadn't sadly passed away. And the last one would be Johnny, uh, Johnny Mac, John McEnroe, the tennis player. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a tennis tragic and... Uh, I grew up uh, watching in the middle of the night, as it was for us, watching Lendl, McEnroe, Borg, McEnroe. So uh, I'd love, and it would be quite a lot of fun. I'd love to sit down with Johnny Mac. <laughs> that would be, that, that would be fun. Uh, have you ever been to Graceland? I'm a big Elvis fan. I have. Yeah, I went there in 2017. And uh, I even have my own version of the Jungle Room at home. So uh, now I'm there on the fan. <laughs> You've taken it to another level. See, this is why we well, ask these questions. This is well, why we ask yeah. these questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's good stuff. All right. Uh, you got your party of four. Are you guys in a uh, dive bar or you fine dining? 
Oh, it's definitely a dive bar. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's. Uh, I, I wouldn't take uh, John McEnroe to a fancy restaurant. So. No, that's right. uh, you might get thrown uh, out. And no matter where you went, Elvis would order the uh, peanut butter and bacon sandwich. So I was going to have to that's right. You're probably, probably going to need a dive bar. All right, last question. Um, give me a prediction. We always do this. Give me a prediction. Something you think is going to happen within our industry within the next 12 to 18 months, Jan. I think you're going to see this continuation of this massive change around sustainability and travel. I mean, I know this is a bit boring getting back to uh, to the business topic but we, we just see exponential growth as companies become much more attuned to the impact that they're having on the environment whether it be in their buildings and power supplies and, and everything else but right the way through to travel and a lot of the time it's the staff that are pushing this um customers investors yes but a lot of people a lot of want to work for businesses which take this stuff seriously so it's a pretty easy call for us because we see it every day but we predict over the next 12 months that the list of companies, particularly US companies on that sustainable uh, or science-based target sustainable uh, list will grow exponentially from here. Well said, I don't disagree. Uh, so that's it, James. I wanna thank you, uh, James, for joining us today. Uh, I would also like to thank those of you who joined live and hope you will join us again on our next installment of Xeno Live. Until that time, this is Tony D signing off. Thanks, Tony.